¿Es Estados Unidos aliado del terrorismo islámico? ¿Es su ejército mucho más cruel que el ruso en Ucrania? A continuación responde el antiguo coronel del ejército de Estados Unidos, Richard Black. I volunteered to join the Marines and, and uh, uh, I volunteered to go to Vietnam. Uh, I fought in, in the bloodiest Marine campaign of the entire war. Uh, and uh, I, I was a helicopter pilot through to, flew 269 combat missions. My aircraft was hit by ground fire on four missions. Uh, I then fought on the ground with the 1st Marine Division and uh, during one of the 70 patrols, combat patrols that I made, uh, my radio men were both killed and I was wounded while we were attacking and trying to rescue a surrounded Marine outpost. Um, so uh, I, I'm very pro-American. I actually was a part of NATO and was prepared to to die in Germany uh, to, to defend against an attack by the Soviet Union. Our objective was overthrow the legitimate government of Syria. And in order to do that, we employed uh, proxy soldiers who were the, the, the most vile of all terrorists. Um, something very similar is happening right now in, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, the war began in 2011 when the United States landed uh, central intelligence operatives to begin coordinating with Al Qaeda and other terrorist groups. And uh, we have been unwavering supporters of Al Qaeda since before the war formally began. Uh, we are supporters of Al Qaeda today where they're bottled up in Idlib province. Um, the CIA supplied them under secret Operation Timber Sycamore. We gave them all of their anti-tank weapons, all of their anti-air missiles. And uh, uh, Al-Qaeda has always been our proxy uh, force on the ground. They, together with ISIS, have carried out the mission of the United States together with a, a great number of affiliates that really are kind of interchangeable. You have the Free Syrian Army. Soldiers move from ISIS to Al Qaeda to Free Syrian Army rather fluidly. And um, so we, we started that war, but, but the United States has a strategic policy of using proxies to engage in war. The war didn't exist until we sent the CIA to coordinate with Al Qaeda elements. So we began the war and uh, we were not invited into Syria. The United States invaded that portion. We actually put troops on the ground, uh, illegal against any standard international law of war. We facilitated the movement of, of Islamic terrorists from 100 countries, and they came and they joined ISIS, they joined Al Qaeda, they joined the Free Syrian Army, all of these different ones. And one of the things that they knew when they arrived is that they were lawfully entitled to murder the husbands, and I'm not talking about military people, I'm talking about civilian. They could murder the husbands, they could kill them, and then they could possess and own their wives and their children. And they did it in vast numbers. And so there was a, there was a campaign of rape. It was an organized campaign of rape across the nation of Syria. And uh, there, there actually were slave markets that, that arose in certain of these uh, rebel areas where they, they actually had price lists of, of the different women. And interestingly, the highest prices went to the youngest children because there were a great number of pedophiles 
and the pedophiles wanted to possess small children because under the laws that were applied, they were permitted to rape these children repeatedly. They were able to rape the widows of the slain soldiers or the slain civilians and, uh, and possess them and buy them and sell them among themselves. This went on, I'm not saying that the CIA created this policy, but they understood that it was a widespread policy and they condoned it. They, they never criticized it in any way. Uh, they had always followed the Islamic law, which was that, that a child's citizenship derived from the father. But there were so many tens, hundreds of thousands of Syrian women impregnated by these terrorists who were imported into Syria that it was necessary to change the law so that they would have Syrian citizenship and they wouldn't have to be returned to their ISIS father in Saudi Arabia or in Tunisia. The Caesar sanctions were the most brutal sanctions ever imposed on ever, any nation. I mean, during the Second World War, sanctions were not nearly as strict as they were on Syria. We weren't at war with Syria, and yet we were in. We had a we had a naval blockade uh, around the the country. <clears throat> we devalued their currency through the SWIFT system for international payments, making it impossible for them to purchase medications. So you had Syrian women who would contract breast cancer, just like we have here in this country. But instead of here in this country where breast cancer has become relatively treatable, we cut off the medical supplies so that the women in Syria would die of breast cancer because they could not get the medications because we slammed their, their, uh, their uh, dollars through the SWIFT system. The, one of the last things that we did, and, and the evidence is, is vague on it, but there was a mysterious explosion in the harbor of, uh, of in, in Lebanon. And uh, it was a massive explosion of a, of a shipload of, of uh, ammonium nitrate fertilizer. It killed hundreds of, of Lebanese people. It, uh, it wounded thousands and thousands, destroyed the economy of Lebanon, and most importantly, it destroyed the banking system of Lebanon, which was one of the few lifelines remaining to Syria. I don't think that explosion was accidental. I think it was orchestrated, and I suspect that the Central Intelligence Agency was aware of the nation that carried out that, that action to destroy Beirut Harbor. But throughout, you see this, this Machiavellian approach where we use unlimited force and violence. And at the same time, we control the, the global media to where we erase all discussions of what's truly happening. So to, the, to the, the man, the woman in the street, they think things are fine. Everything is, is being done for altruistic reasons, but it's not. So no, uh, Russia was not in any respect responsible for the uh, massive destruction of the city of Aleppo. The importance of, of taking that part of Syria is that it is the breadbasket for all of the Syrian people. That is where the wheat, uh, Syria actually had a significant wheat surplus, and the people were very well fed in Syria before the war. We wanted to take the wheat away to cause famine among the Syrian people. And the idea was that by 
stealing the oil and the, and the gas, we would be able to shut down the transportation system. And at the same time, during the Syrian winters, we could freeze to death the Syrian civilian population, which in many cases were living in, in rubble, where, where the these terrorist armies with mechanized divisions had attacked and just totally destroyed these, these cities and left people just living in little pockets of rubble. I, I would say that uh, making war on a civilian population is a crime of, of grave significance in, in the law of war. Um, one of the things that we did as we as we allied ourselves with Al Qaeda and on and off with ISIS, I mean, we fought ISIS in, in a very serious way, but at the same time, we often employed them to use against the Syrian government. So it's kind of a love hate, but we have always worked with the with the terrorists. They were the they were the core. When we fight these wars, we have no limits on the, the cruelty and the in, inhumanity that we're prepared to impose on the people, making them suffer so that somehow that will translate into overthrowing the government and uh, perhaps taking taking their oil, taking their their resources. But in any event, we are trying to do something similar as we roll to the east, right up virtually to the to the Ukrainian border, or to the, to the Russian border, rather. President Putin made a desperate effort to to stop the march towards war. Back in in December of 2021, he went so far as to put specific written proposals on the table with NATO, peace proposals to, to defuse what was coming about. Because at this point, Ukraine was massing troops to attack the Donbass. Uh, and uh, so he was trying to head this off. He didn't want war. And uh, NATO just blew it off, just dismissed it. Uh, never took it seriously, never went into serious negotiations. At that point, Putin, seeing that uh, that armed Ukrainians uh, with weapons to kill Russian troops were literally on their borders, decided he had to strike first. Now you could see that this was not this was not some pre-planned attack and. Uh, Ukraine had massed this enormous army to attack against the Donbass. And so Russia was forced to go in to preempt that, uh, that planned attack by Ukraine. And uh, you could see that Russia very much hoped that they could conduct this special operation without unduly causing casualties for the Ukrainians, because they, they, they think of the Ukrainians, or at least they did think of the Ukrainians as, as brother Slavs, uh, that uh, they, they wanted to have good relations. But there, there was a famous picture with a, a Russian tank that had been stopped by a gathering of maybe 40 civilians who just walked out in the road and blocked the road and the tank stopped. I can tell you in Vietnam, if we had had uh, a bunch of people who, who stood in the way of an American tank going through, that tank would not have slowed down in the slightest. It wouldn't have honked a horn. It wouldn't have done anything. Wouldn't have fired a warning shot. It would have just gone on. And, and, uh, and, and I think that's, more typical. I'm not. I'm not criticizing the Americans. Uh, I, I would. I was there and I was fighting, and I probably would have would have driven the tanks straight through myself. But what I'm saying is that 
the the rules of engagement for the Russians were very, very cautious. They didn't want to create a great deal of hatred and animosity. They The Russians did not go in. They did not bomb uh, the electrical system, the, the media systems, uh, the water systems, all of these, the, the, the bridges and so forth. They tried to retain uh, the infrastructure of Ukraine in good shape because they they wanted it to get back. They just wanted this to be over with and get back to normal. <clears throat> it didn't work. The Ukrainians, the, the resistance was unexpectedly uh, hard. Uh, the Ukrainian soldiers fought with, with great, great valor, great heroism. And, uh, and so now the, the, the game has been upped and it's become much, much more serious. But uh, it is amazing to look and, and to see that Russia dominates the air. They haven't knocked out the train systems. They haven't knocked out power plants. They haven't knocked out uh, so many things. They've never bombed the, uh, uh, the, the buildings in the center of Kyiv. They, you know, the, the capital of, uh, of Ukraine. They haven't bombed the, the buildings where the parliament meets. Uh, they, they've been incredibly reserved about these things, hoping against hope that peace could be achieved. But I don't think, I don't think Ukraine has anything to do with the decision about peace or war. I think the decision about peace or war is made in Washington, D.C. Uh, as long as we want the war to continue, we will fight that war using Ukrainians as proxies, and we will fight it to the last Ukrainian death. And I'm not saying that there aren't war crimes happening on both sides. I'm just telling you the only ones where I have seen fairly irrefutable proof of war crimes have been on the Ukrainian side. Now, often you, you hear it said, well, the, the Russians have, you know, they've destroyed this or destroyed that. We destroyed virtually everything uh, in, in Iraq, everything of, of significance. Every, we, we bombed military and civilian targets uh, without much discrimination. The coalition flew 100,000 sorties in 42 days. You compare that to the Russians who have only flown 8,000 sorties in about the same period of time. And I think the, the Russians have tended to be more selective, whereas we went out, we, the shock and all, the, the, the philosophy of shock and all is that you destroy everything that is needed to sustain human life and to, for, for a city to function. You knock out the water supply, the electrical supply, uh, the the heat, uh, the you know the oil, the gasoline, so that you you knock out all of the major bridges, um, and then you just continue and you just destroy everything. So it, it's really ironic that uh, and, and keep in mind, Iraq is a is a relatively small country. Ukraine is a huge country, 100,000 sorties in 42 days, 8,000 sorties in about the same time. A tremendous difference in violence between what we did in Iraq and what they have done in Ukraine. Now, we are shipping fantastic quantities of weapons. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's uh, caused the stock of Raytheon, which creates missiles, and Northrop Grumman, which creates aircraft and so forth, and missiles. 
Uh, all of these defense industries have become tremendously bloated with, with uh, tax dollars. And now it has come to light that apparently there are 50 French senior officers who are trapped uh, in that steel plant along with the Ukrainians. The French soldiers have been on the ground fighting, directing the battle. And this was kept under wraps, ultra secret, uh, because of the French elections that just occurred. Had the French people known that there were a large number of French officers trapped and probably going to die in that steel plant, uh, the elections would have gone the other way. Marine Le Pen would have won. And uh, uh, so it was very important that for the entire deep state that it not come to light that these French officers were there. We know that there are NATO officers who are present in on the ground in Ukraine as advisors and so forth. We don't care. The United States and NATO, we do not care how many Ukrainians die, not civilians, not women, not children, not soldiers. We do not care. We are it's it's. It's become a great football game. Uh, you know, we've got our team, they've got our team, rah, rah. We want to get the biggest score and run it up. And, uh, you know, we don't care how many, how many of our players get, uh, get uh, crippled on the, on the playing field uh, as long as we win. In any event, the United States has, has we have this long-standing uh, strategy, this political military strategy of expanding the empire. We did it in the Middle East, where we attempted to create a massive neo-colonial empire. Uh, it's, it became rather frayed. The people did not want it. And uh, uh, it, it, it seems to be uh, doomed to extinction sometime, but it may go on for another hundred years. Uh, the Soviet Union dissolved, the Warsaw Pact dissolved, and unfortunately, one of the one of the great tragedies of history is that we failed to dissolve NATO. We we have two uh, two Republican. I, I happen to be Republican, but two Republican uh, U.S. senators who have said that well we might just need to use nuclear nuclear weapons against Russia uh, that is insane about 10 days after 9/11 I went through the Pentagon and I saw Secretary Rumsfeld and and Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz I went downstairs just to say hello to some of the people on the joint staff who used used to work for me and one of the generals called me and he said sir you got to come in you got to come in and talk to me a second I said well you're too busy he said no no he says you, we've made the decision we're going to war with Iraq. This was on or about the 20th of September. I said, we're going to war with Iraq? Why? He said, I don't know. <laughs> he said, I guess they don't know what else to do. So uh, I said, well, did they find some information collect connecting Saddam to al-Qaeda? He said, no, no. He says, there's nothing new that way. They have just made the decision to go to war with Iraq. He said, I guess it's like we don't know what to do about terrorists, but we've got a good military and we can take down governments. And um, he said, I guess if, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem has to look like a nail. So I came back to see him a few weeks later. And by that time, we were bombing in Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And he said, oh, it's worse than that. He said, he reached over on his desk. He picked up a piece of paper. He said, I just... He said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense's office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. The truth is about the Middle East is, had there been no oil there, it would be like Africa. Nobody is threatening to intervene in Africa. 
The problem is the opposite. We keep asking for people to intervene and stop it. And there's, uh, there's no question that the presence of petroleum throughout the region has sparked great power involvement. Whether that was the specific motivation for the coup or not, I can't tell you, but, but there was definitely, there's always been this attitude that somehow we could intervene and use force in the region.